Well, it's, it's lovely to hear uh, someone like Julian with so much insight for. Um, I, I, I'm not qualified in any way to talk about images, so I'm not going to. Uh, all I'm going to do is talk about my experience. Um, before I start, I'd just like to know: Is there anybody in this room at the moment who's who's really struggling with things at the moment? Who's been diagnosed or? <laughs> right. Okay. Is it really struggling? Like what level? Like do we have to struggle? Depression? depression? Is it leading to? Is it into what interfering with your work? Okay. Great. So. Um, I was there eight years ago. Uh, now I'm not shy about talking about my age, I know the older than I am. I'm 41. Uh, and eight years ago, uh, I just bought my first house, um, just getting married. Um, I was working as a fashion photographer, shooting a big story for Hong Kong Tatler. Um, stress up to about here. Um, now, Marriage, new house, career, it was just too demanding. And also, interesting um, hearing you speak again is that a very unorthodox childhood, grew up, you know, we all have, I'm going to whinge on about it, but we had an exceptional childhood, uh, you know, and um, some tough times. And very much, I very much fit into that category <coughs> of um, hyper alert, hyper, always on, always switched on, always thinking, what can I do, what can I do? should be doing this, always self-guilt, you know, I should be doing more, I should be doing more, I should be doing more, got to please them, got to please them, got to please them. That's my personality, I don't think I'll ever, I'll ever change that, and I don't think I'll manage that, that's me. Um, but uh, walking down the stairs, and I could hear a ringing in my head, and sort of wasn't too panicked about it, I'd heard it before, going out to clubs, and you get home, your ears ring for a couple of days. But okay, sort of noted it. Um, as I say, I was working on this particular story, it had, the deadline was on and I was retouching and my, my Mac died. And it was like, okay, the deadline's 12 hours away. Uh, and I had to drive, rang up a mate, can I borrow your computer? Drove, you know, 30 miles to go and get it, got home, kept retouched through the night, which wasn't unusual, I'd retouch and edit images through the night and uh, that sort of thing. And um, that's when it sort of started. And went to bed that night and thought, cool, it's a new house, the, the, the water system upstairs is really loud, it's squeaking, you know, uh, realised I didn't have a water system, um, then, then it got worse, then, it, then the volume turned up, and I, it was bad, it was bad, so I immediately went to a GP, big mistake, big mistake, so the way I look at it is that a GP's got to be a, uh, a genius on everything, and they're simply not, they're human beings, probably trained 20 years ago, five minutes on tinnitus, told that there's nothing you can do about it, and they're very happy to, to spread that word. Uh, so that's why I'm really grateful here, because I think we're, it's really the beginning of, you know, with social media, we can get the message out that it's completely curable. I just want to say now before I proceed, before I tell you how dark it was, that I'm completely better. And I, I, I relate to your story about being a pigeon. I remember I was lying in bed, and Bit of good news before I go to the dark stuff. And <laughs> Michael Jackson's Will You Be There, great song anyway, was on. And I woke up and I could hear it and I thought, I can hear it how I used to hear it. I, it's not underneath this layer of, for me it was a high pitched noise. And I love music, music's everything to me. And why a lot of people said I had to I used to be in a band. So, oh, you were in a band, loud music, you, you've damaged your ears, oh, it makes sense, you've got tinnitus. Uh, so, anyway, dark place. Um, and again, I, you know, I, I consider myself uh, a strong character. I don't think, uh, um, you know, or, or at least I put up the front. And I, I don't think I'd ever consider killing myself, you know. But at one point, it was so loud that I, I couldn't, I couldn't understand how I could continue with it. So I'm not saying that I considered suicide, but I thought I can't do this. I can't wake up and hear this scream in my ear, and that for the rest of my life. Now, after going to see three or four GPs, that's the sort of guy I am, I'm not shy to knock on the door to say, look, come on, someone solve it. This is, this is stupid and not, so I'm, I'm, you know, the squeaky wheel hits the oil, so I'm, I'm you know, if I, there's something wrong, I moan about it. So I went to four GPs, all the same thing, and there's nothing you can do, it's gonna get, you know, learn to live with it. Go on the internet, worst thing you can do, um, and also what happens is people that are suffering with it will go on the internet and, and uh, tell their story. 
uh, people who are better from it, I think, are so glad to be rid of it. They don't want to talk about it again. And so you never hear the good news. You never hear the good bit. Um, so, um, just bad. Um, I, I struggled with depression. Um, I went into, uh, effectively, I knew later that I went into a post traumatic stress disorder. And I think that was triggered, probably the same thing that triggered the tinnitus, and the tinnitus triggered more anxiety, and it spiraled to the point where it was, you know, I, I didn't know how I could continue. And one of the things I couldn't do with this, this hyper everything was look at the screen anymore, because, you know, my whole career was based on image making and looking at the screen. And if I looked at the screen, I would physically throw up. I would, and uh, I was on, just got married, we were on a honeymoon, and I, I was sure I had uh, a tumour. I was thinking it must be a tumour. It's, it's something physical. This isn't, you know, it's not in my head, because that's the, also for people to tell you, you're imagining it. Something very different to, there's a difference between imagining something and your brain doing something. So the sound that you hear is very real, um, but it's not a physical sound. Yeah, so you're hearing a sound, so it's very real, you're not imagining it. There's a big difference between imagining it and, and experiencing it. Um, so on honeymoon, I sort of forgot about that the screens made me sick, so I was worried about how I'm gonna make a living. And we had a memory card, and we went into a shop just to print the images, and I put them in, and they popped up on the screen. Then I, I was physically sick, because I'd looked at the screen, but I hadn't associated it with being the screen. And so that's confirmation that it wasn't me being, you know. Anyway, bad, bad times. Got back from the honeymoon, had a CAT scan, and it was so bad that I was hoping they would find a tumour, because I thought, if they find a tumour, there's a solution. Came out of the CAT scan, nothing wrong. Um, that was it. And then the turning point came six months after the first realism I had it. And I was lucky enough, um, well actually, I, I, I'd met a few ENT specialists, and luckily enough, I just booked a, an appointment with somebody that done tinnitus at my local hospital, but privately. Booked it, you know, a couple of hundred quid, I think it was. Uh, and he saw me the next day, and just by luck, I, his name's escaped me at the moment, but he's, he's written books on tinnitus, he's, he's very high up, and I was very lucky to find him. And I sat down, and I said, thinking I was mad, saying, even when I touch my skin, I can hear it. This, this could turn it on for me. So if I'd done that, it would, it would heighten in volume. I can, you could hear it in my skin. I know that sounds absolutely crazy. And I told him that, he said, it doesn't sound crazy at all. He said, look, you're a 33-year-old guy, uh, you're healthy apart from this, you're obviously a stress head, but you're going to get better. And it was like medicine. I said, you, I said, you're, I said you're not allowed to say, I'm allowed to get better, how are you? you you're, is this psychology? And he said, no, no, you, you're going to get better. And that was the turning point, because he made me understand that there wasn't a tumour, there wasn't a cut in my ear, there wasn't anything wrong with my eardrums, the nerves hadn't been burned by music. Um, he said, what it is, is, so he explained the post-traumatic stress disorder, and he said, you've got to learn to relax with it. And it was like, wow, okay. So, after that, it wasn't a miracle cure, but I knew there was, I knew I would get better. And that changes everything, because it changes your mental state. Um, so from that point on, I came out of there walking, lighter, rang my wife and said, I'm going to get better. I'm, it's going to get better. Someone's told me I'm going to get better. And that meant everything. And so taking his advice, um, he, he, he told me about the mechanism, that the filter in my brain was damaged, so you know, I'm seeing too much light, I'm hearing too much noise, I'm smelling too much whatever. Um, and he gave me a great example. He said, if you're at a party, um, then there's a whole crowd of people and you're talking away, and you can't hear these hundred conversations, but then someone says your name, and, and you pick it out. What we don't realise is that we're hearing so much all the time, but we're tuning it out. Our brains are brilliant, and they're tuning everything out. And so, but you are hearing it, and you are processing it, because the minute someone says your name, and you go, oh, I'm in a conversation with this, but I've heard everybody talking about their holidays, but I'm not hearing it, you turn on, and you go, ah. Oh, proves you're listening. If I said to any of you now, are you aware of 
the, the fabric touching your arm. Are you aware of that sensation? Now you are, because I've said it. But before, you're not aware of the fabric touching. So your brain is filtering out all the, all the, all the data you don't need. Your brain is filtering out. When you get stressed, when you're hyper alert, when you're in fight or flight mode, you're panicked. And if you're a soldier in the trenches, you want to be turned on because you don't want to be uh, tuning out the, the German guy coming up behind you. So you're on, you're turned on. And we get ourselves into states where we're turned on. I, I always thought, all right, my career, I've got to be amazing in my career. I've got to be intelligent. I have to be turned on all the time. So I stimulate myself as well. And it's not a good way to be. You've got to get a balance. So you know, once I understood that I was just too turned on, you know, um, then I could start thinking about how do I take it down? How do I relax? How do I stop doing everything? So I've gotten so far that I couldn't go to work if I wanted to. Uh, I'm freelance. If I don't do it, I don't get paid. And uh, you know, financial pressure is on me. There's no one else in my in my home that brings in brings in the money. So you know. Um, so and again, it's my character. I'm not going to suddenly be a, a, a chilled out person. So you know, how do I get rid of the stimulus? So it's a case for me. Understanding that we're going to get better, understanding a bit of the mechanism, the more you panic, the more you hear it, the more you hear it, the more you panic, and the worse it gets. That's, that was the turning point, so that I could sit and be quiet, and it would just calm down. Now, um, I was very much isolated in this. All I had had was this one appointment with this one doctor. Um, so I didn't know anything about cranial therapy or anything like that, so I had to solve it myself. Or you know, I knew the internet wasn't the solution. There was just not one positive message on YouTube or anything. The, the last thing I wanted was more negative reinforcement. So to stay away from that, have this belief. And so I just started to relax. It sounds a stupid thing. If someone said, just chill out, I, I you know, threw something at me. Because, oh, you're just too stressed, chill out. It's like, you know, how much use is that? I'm stressed because I've got this to do, I've got that to do. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna chill out. But I had to chill out, that I actually had to chill out. And um, it, was, it was being able to, I wouldn't advise anyone to go into the quietest room they can find and listen for it, because that's what I used to do. Oh, it's there, how loud is it? Let me go somewhere really quiet and hear it. Oh my God, it's terrifying, you know? Give yourself a break, constantly don't listen to it. But when you're feeling confident, go and sit somewhere with a little bit of background noise, have a window open, and don't listen for it. It's difficult to explain. Don't listen to for it, but let yourself hear it. And when you hear it, you know that it's your body saying, you're in danger. It's your body looking after you. Your body saying you're in danger. And so you say, okay, but I'm not. You think I am. So thank you for the message, but you can tell your body you're okay as well. But I'm okay, there's no, there's no one with a gun behind me. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in a war situation. I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe. This noise is okay. Noise is there to help me, and um, I would meditate. I was nothing, nothing uh, genius about it. I would sit down on a not a boy's own chair, on a normal chair, so my feet would be on the floor, and I'd put my hands like this, and I'd simply breathe. And I'd, quiet room, a bit of ambient noise, and just chill out, just chill out. Um, and I used to, I accept it. I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic as well. Or, Catholic, I believe in God, and so for me, prayer was important. So I'd sit here, the most simplest prayer in the world is just, you know, please Jesus come to me. That was it, over and over again. And I'm not going to freak anybody out because I know, you know, religion, whether it's Buddha, whether, you know, whatever it is, uh, grounding yourself and just being calm and quiet, whatever it is, or just, just relaxing, thinking about happy thoughts, thinking about, but whatever it is, just to relax you. Um, and that done wonders for me. Another thing I used to do is, I could never imagine it turning off. But I, I used to, a, a strange image, but it came to my head, I imagined a sink full of ice, a frozen sink. And I would say to myself, every time I sit down to meditate, I'm going to imagine that ice getting smaller. And I wasn't too ambitious, I thought, if it's going to take months, it's going to take months. And I remember this solid lump of ice, and I'd close my eyes and I'd think about this lump of ice. And eventually I'd see little bits of water appearing. And as the months went past, um, it was a block of ice floating in the sink. And so it got to the point where there was little bits of ice left in the bottom of the sink. And as they faded, it was relative to what I was hearing. And as they faded, disappeared, so did the sound. And 
When I say that I'm completely cured from tinnitus, what I mean is that 99.9% .9 of the time, I wake up in silence, I go through my day in silence, and now and again, why, when I've had, when I've worked through the night, which I still do, which I've done on Monday, particularly a stressful time at work at the moment, um, it comes back a tiny bit, and I go, okay, but I'm confident. Now I know you, and I listen to it, and it disappears again. I don't have a, I don't have a period where it lasts more than 15 minutes, and when it does come back, it's so quiet, I'm not even sure it's there anyway. So, yeah, that's my story. That's it.